makes me white as snow. No. James 3, verses 1 through 10. Not many of you should, should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone who does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, sustaining the whole body, staining the whole body and setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your grace, your mercy. Please help Brent as he brings us the message, and please help us to receive it. Uh, please help us to control our tongues. Please help us to glorify your name with our tongues. Uh, please help us to give us wisdom for all these things. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's sing and sing again.
in power resurrected as we will be when he Finding your way in your copy of God's Word to the fourth chapter of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4.
Let's pray. Father, we praise you that we can be here this morning, that we can meet in public without fear to study the Word of God and to worship King Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful privilege that you've given us. Uh, forgive us where we take it for granted. Lord, as we get into the book of Ephesians again, we want to ask that you'd help us to pay attention and that you'd help us by your Spirit to take to heart what is being said to us uh, through the Apostle Paul in this glorious book of the Bible. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to put on the new man and put off the old man. You know how mightily we struggle <clears throat> with sin and with the flesh and with the world and with the devil. And we ask, Lord, that as we look at this scripture today, that you would fortify our souls to increasingly live in a way that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for myself. I ask that I could know you as I preach. Uh, nothing better, Lord, could could happen as I preach today than that I and, and we would leave here knowing you better. Please grant that, Holy Spirit. I ask for unction. I ask for power uh, to proclaim your word in a way that is winsome and true and faithful and bold and gentle all at the same time. Uh, Holy Spirit, thank you that uh, you're able to help me. Uh, we uh, read earlier that scripture from James that no man can tame the tongue. Uh, thank God the Holy Spirit can. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would set a guard over my mouth, and I would not say anything that would uh, dishonor or bring reproach to Jesus during our time together. <clears throat> I pray, Lord, that you would continue to build your church here. We thank and praise you uh, for what you are doing, uh, have done, and will do through Grace Bible Church. We ask that you would continue to equip us as a church with everything that we need to do your will. And most of all, Father, we need faith, and we need devotion to Christ, uh, and we need strength in our inner man. Uh, so use our time together to that end, Lord, to strengthen us in our inner man. We pray that Jesus would be honored and pleased with our time together now. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to pick up again in Ephesians 4. <clears throat> we're going to read verse 17. Go down through verse 30. Ephesians 4, 17 to 30. Paul is uh, teaching us how to live as people who have been saved by grace and grace alone. Uh, that the gospel must flesh out in the details of our daily life. Verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you, you Christian people, must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him do labor. Let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And now the next two verses are where we're going to focus this morning. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So in the 1860s, a well-known children's proverb made its first appearance. You all know it. It's very well known. It goes like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And to this day, 160 years later, it remains a children's proverb because no adult is crazy enough to believe that that's true. Uh, words really do hurt. They have the power to do great damage, and they have the power uh, to greatly help those to whom we speak them. 
Uh, the effect that words have on us is oftentimes more painful than any sticks and stones that people might beat our physical bodies with. Our words are so powerful, the Bible says, that they have uh, uh, the ability to kill or to give life. Proverbs 18 and verse 21 says this. <clears throat> Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Our words have the power to heal and help, or on the other hand, to hurt and hinder. Our speech, our words are so important in the sight of God. In this last paragraph of Ephesians 4, Paul's been getting down to the nitty-gritty of the Christian life. He's been showing us that uh, being a Christian is not meant to be some profession or simply some set of doctrine that we agree to, as important as doctrine is. It's supposed to come down to the fine details, the most mundane details of our daily life, uh, including how we speak. Uh, he's been showing us how to take off the old man and put on our new identity in Christ. And so uh, three weeks ago, I believe it was, uh, we learned that we should take off falsehood and put on truth. Uh, then we learned that we should take off sinful anger and put off righteous anger. Last week, we learned that we should take off stealing and put on generosity. And as we continue uh, to ask this question as Christian people, what behaviors should we take off and what behaviors should we put on, Paul gives us a fourth answer here in verses 29 and 30, which is this. Uh, we should take off corrupt speech and we should put on edifying speech. Take off corrupt speech, put on edifying speech. Look with me at verse 29 again, please. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. No corrupting talk. Well, if we're going to uh, cease to utter corrupting talk, we would need to know what corrupting talk is. The word corrupting is uh, sapros. It, it means rotten. Let no rotten talk come out of your mouth. Corrupt talk refers to language that is rotten or spreads rottenness. Paul warned Timothy against corrupt talk that spreads rottenness among the people of God in 2 Timothy Chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, where he wrote this. <clears throat> he said to Timothy, Avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. What, what, is, what is gangrene? It's rotting flesh that spreads and overtakes other flesh and rots that flesh. Uh, the corrupt talk is rotten talk and it spreads. Paul, Paul said that false teaching in a reverent Bible would spread like gangrene. So not only is uh, corrupt speech rotten, it spreads rottenness. For example, uh, gossip is one form of corrupt speech that spreads rottenness within the body of Christ. If we share a juicy prayer request with a friend, he or she will tell two other friends who will tell two or three other friends who will tell two or three other friends, and the rot of that gossip spreads like gangrene through the church. A gentleman named D.E. Host uh, was an extraordinarily skilled people manager, and he was also a student of human behavior, and he took over the leadership of the China Inland Mission after Hudson Taylor died, and he had to manage more than a thousand missionaries across China in his post as director of the China Inland Mission. And here's what D.E. Host said uh, as he reflected on one of the most troubling problems uh, that his missionary uh, work had en encountered. He said this, he said, quote, looking back over these 50 years, I really think that if I were asked to mention one thing which has done more harm and occasioned more sorrow and division in God's work than anything else, I should say tail-bearing. So here's a guy who's over a thousand missionaries in China. He's, what's done the most harm? Is it persecution? Is it lack of missionaries? Is it lack of funds? It's tail-bearing. It's gossip. It's the rot of corrupt speech. If you and I are going to put off corrupting talk, we're going to have to be careful, for one thing, not to be tail bearers or gossips. Uh, how do you stop gossip? Well, you just refuse to repeat it, right? This is what the author of Proverbs says in 2620. He says, For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. It's a great little verse, isn't it? Where there's no wood, the fire goes out. Where there's nobody whispering, gossip and quarreling stops. Well, how else do you stop gossip? Uh, 
you can kindly tell the people who's share, uh, uh, who are sharing these nuggets with you, you know, I would really appreciate it if you didn't tell me things like that. I, I, I don't want to hear gossip. That hurts me. Can you imagine how many churches <laughs> uh, right now would be alive rather than dead if somebody would have had the nerve to say that to somebody in the church? I'm always uh, amazed and troubled by Christian people who seem to know everything that's going on with everybody everywhere all the time. Uh, these, these kind of Christian people trouble me. Uh, they have the drop on everyone and everything. Um, I never know what's going on anywhere except in my church because, my goodness, I don't have time. Where, where do people get the time to talk about everything with everybody everywhere? I, I just don't have time to do that. Uh, it's not that I'm a particularly holy person. I just don't have time for it. Uh, and furthermore, I don't, I don't care. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the free time to get the scoop on everyone. Be very leery of any Christian who seems to have the dirt on everybody that you come in contact with and knows what's going on all over the place all the time. Uh, so gossip is one form of corrupt or rotten speech. Corrupt speech is also the more obvious culprits like what? What do you think of? Cursing, lewdness, obscene talk. Dirty jokes, that's the first thing that comes to our mind when we think about corrupt speech as Christian people. And of course, those are examples of rotten talk that spreads really quick. So all of you men who've worked on a job site, uh, if you're there with a, a dozen other men on your crew and there's one guy there that's got a foul mouth or a lewd mouth, what happens over the course of six months? Well, people are cussing more and more and other people are telling more and more dirty jokes and it's, it's like rot. It's like cancer. It just infects everybody there. Another example of corrupt or rotten talk is speech uh, that stirs up strife. Strife stirring speech. So when we rant and fume about the wrongs that people have committed against us, what does that do to the folks that are hearing our ranting and fuming? Do they, do they get more peaceful and calm? No, they get more and more angry too. And they get more and more jacked up and upset as our ranting and strife stirring spreads like cancer. And eventually it has a harmful spiritual effect on them as well. <coughs> James 3, 5 says this. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. So Paul talks about uh, the corruption, the rottenness spreading uh, like a, a disease or a cancer. James says it's like, it's like a little match, rotten talk is. Uh, you can strike a little match and there'll be a flame smaller than, th than the fingernail on your little finger. And in a matter of hours, there can be a hundred acres on fire. So rotten, corrupt speech has a contagious spreading effect. Proverbs 15.1 says this, A soft answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. So our speech is corrupt when it stirs up anger and it stirs up strife in the people who hear us. Uh, cutting words, cutting words create conflict. You know, my, fa my family tells me sometimes, man, you can have a really sharp tongue. Yes, I can. I'm a sinner. <laughs> and I, I have some cutting words in my flesh. Uh, harsh, inflammatory words exacerbate conflict. Kind, gracious words have a calming effect. So in this battle to put off corrupting talk, we should eliminate cutting words from our vocabulary. So we have to learn how to uh, speak what's true in a way that's firm and gets people's attention without cutting them and belittling them. And that's hard to do, isn't it? We need the Holy Spirit's help not to belittle and mock and insult and demean God's people. Uh, what about responding to people outside the church? Uh, don't respond to mean, nasty talk with more mean, nasty talk. Uh, a true response and a firm response is very helpful to those outside the church. But we stray into corrupt talk when we return evil words with what? Evil words. I mean, this, this, this is the plague of social media, is it not? A bunch, of, a, a bunch of people just ranting back and forth at each other, words flying everywhere, cutting, cutting folks all to pieces, and uh, one says something nasty to this one, and this one responds with something even nastier, and back and forth and back and forth you go until nobody's even thinking anymore. Rot going everywhere. Uh, Luke 6, 27, 28, Jesus said, uh, But I say to you who hear, 
Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. So when uh, people outside the body of Christ curse us and run us down, uh, uh, call us homophobes and hate mongers and uh, people who oppress women, uh, don't return that kind of vitriol. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Uh, What about using exaggerated speech to describe other people? Uh, we need to be very careful about that when we, when, we, when, we, when we talk about other people, we want to be accurate in the way that we're talking about them instead of using exaggerated speech that stirs up strife. All right, what about, uh, what about the discussion of God honoring speech being tied to verse 17? Look at Ephesians 4, 17. Paul says this, Uh, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. What uh, characterizes the speech of unconverted people, of Gentile people? Think think about the lost people you know. What characterizes their speech? Yes, some of them are foul-mouthed. Yes, some of them are are lewd in their speech. But, But what is another dominating characteristic? Lost people just say too much. They talk too much. Excess and lack of control characterizes the speech of unconverted people. Ungodly people talk too much. Corrupt speech is is excessive speech. There's a great danger in being someone who talks too much. It's so easy to sin with your tongue that if you talk a lot, eventually you're just going to sin. The the, the mathematical probabilities are going to get to working against you eventually, (laughs) and you're going to say something you shouldn't say. Uh, Proverbs 10 and 19 says this. Proverbs 10, 19. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. So Christian people uh, should not be quick to shoot off at the mouth, right? James 1, 26. James 1, 26. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's Religion is worthless. So as Christian people, uh, we should bridle our tongues. We should not be mouthy people. Corrupt speech is, is just is saying too much. Uh, Christian people should be measured in their speech. We should not be mouthy in our speech. Well, we've talked about some examples of corrupt talk that we're supposed to take off. Now let's talk about the edifying speech that we're supposed to put on as Christian people. Uh, let me ask you this. We've talked about rotten, rotten speech. What happens when a building rots? Well, it falls down, right? And that's why Paul describes the opposite of rotten speech as what? Speech that builds up. You see this in verse 29? Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for... Building up. Corrupt speech rots and tears down. Good speech builds up. As those who've been saved by the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, we are to have increasingly transformed mouths. God help us. By the regenerating work of God the Holy Spirit, we're new creations. Did you see that in verse 24? Look at verse 24. Put on the new self created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So anyone who's a born-again believer in Christ has a new identity, and God gives you a new mouth as well. Put on this new mouth, Paul says. He calls us to replace rotten words with words that build up and strengthen and bless and edify our hearers. Our words are supposed to be constructive instead of destructive. Our words are supposed to build up instead of tear down and bring rot. So uh, picture your spouse or your child or a friend or a co-worker as a fully inflated beach ball, okay? Well, what happens when we fire corrupt talk? at that fully inflated beach ball that is your spouse or friend or child. Well, the more you fire, the more holes there are in the beach ball, and eventually it just deflates, and it's laying there flattened, right? But when we have good edifying speech, it's like blowing air back into the beach ball, and it comes to be what it was intended to be all the time. It takes on its uh, purpose, shape, and form. That's what edifying speech is like. 
Good, edifying words encourage and build up people and help them to reach their full potential in Christ. So our words have the ability to let the air out of people. <laughs> and, and there are some people that need the air let out of them. Uh, when you're talking to your friend and his head is the size of 10 beach balls, let the air out of him. But if it's just a normal beach ball, we don't want to do that. We, we want to edify, encourage, and build up. So parents... Is the way that you and I talk to our children encouraging or discouraging? The general tone and tenor of the way we talk to our kids. So some parents, and sometimes I am this parent, oftentimes I'm, I am this parent, I have a general discouraging way of speaking to my kids. We never want to be those parents that when our kids come to us and say, uh, I'm thinking about doing this or that or the other. I'm sharing hopes. I'm sharing dreams. I'd like to try this. The first word out of your mouth does not need to be you can't. Well, you can't do that or that won't work or you're not smart enough to do that. Uh, you, you're not a hard enough worker to do that. You could never do it. How deflating is that kind of negative talk? Better that they try and fail than hearing the words you can't. And never trying at all. That is corrupt, rotten speech when we discourage our kids. Of course, they need to be discouraged from some things that are just ignorant. But if they have a hope or a dream that's good and decent, don't tell them you can't do that or discourage them or belittle them. That is corrupt talk. What about negative, pessimistic, cynical speech? I'm good at this. Uh, sometimes I come home and I begin to complain about the day or be short and snappy or complain about how awful the country's getting, or criticize something that I see in the house, and that's all what? Well, it's just negative talk, right? And it's like uh, taking a big quilt and soaking it in the water and just throwing it on top of everybody. It's, it's just a wet blanket, and the whole spiritual atmosphere of the house gets heavy and down. It, it, it spreads that negativity throughout my home, and it tears everyone down rather than building them up. Paul says that we should only speak what is, in verse 29, good for building up. Uh, wives, do you try to get your husband to change by criticizing or belittling him? Well, when you do that, he really doesn't have the strength left to change. Husbands, do you try to get your wife to change by criticizing or belittling her? Uh, deflated wives don't have the strength to change. Try encouraging your spouse in instead. You know, there's generally, not always, but there's generally a positive way to say something and get the same point across, uh, whereas you could have said it in a negative way and got that point across. Try to choose the more positive way of speaking. Uh, do our words build up and encourage our spouse, our kids, our co-workers, our peers? Do they create this atmosphere of life and hope and faith, or do our words make for a negative Hopeless, complaining, unbelieving, dreary environment. Here's a few trade-offs that we can make that ensure that our speech is more edifying. Let's trade complaining. When you're tempted to complain today, this evening, say, God, what, what can I verbally give thanks for right now? Trade complaining for thanksgiving. Trade disrespect for being courteous. When you're tempted to say something snarky or, or disrespectful to your kids or your spouse, say, Lord, help me to say something that's courteous and that honors this person. Uh, when you're tempted to be critical, and there's, there's always something to be critical about, right? Can you, be, can you be encouraging? Can you ask God the Holy Spirit, help me to say something that's encouraging instead of something that's just critical? Uh, when you're tempted to say something that's cynical, cynical, and unbelieving. Ask God to help you say something that's hopeful. Why is it that all sports teams want to play on their own home field? You hear sports teams say, we've got the home field advantage. Well, what's so great about the home field advantage? Well, there's thousands of people cheering you on, clapping for you, giving you verbal support. Do those fans ever come out on the field and play? No. But what they're saying to the home team actually makes a difference in the game. That encouragement makes a tangible outcome in the sporting event and it makes a tangible outcome in the lives of people to whom we speak when we use edifying good words. In 2 Chronicles chapter 15, 
there was a king named Asa over the southern kingdom of Judah. And he was seeking to bring about religious reforms in the land of Judah. And a prophet named Azariah came to King Asa with a word of encouragement as Asa set about this difficult task of trying to reform the southern kingdom that had drifted a long way into apostasy. And the prophet Azariah said this in 2 Chronicles 15 and 7. 2 Chronicles 15 and 7. He said, But you, you being Asa, take courage. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. So Asa was trying to bring about religious reforms in Judah. And the prophet Azariah said, Take courage. Don't let your hands be weak. There's going to be a reward for what you're doing, Asa. And the next verse says this, As soon as Asa heard these words, the prophecy of Azariah, he took courage and put away the detestable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities that he had taken in the hill country of Ephraim. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the vestibule of the house of the Lord, etc., etc., etc. The text says, as soon as Asa heard these encouraging words, he went to it. Encouragement matters. It makes a tangible difference in the lives of the people to whom we speak. It makes a tangible difference in our lives when we ourselves are encouraged. Look at verse 29. Verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion. The, the word occasion in the Greek is need. As fits the need that it may give grace to those who hear. So good speech, edifying speech, gives grace to those who hear. We should try to edify uh, people with our words and build them up, but we should also seek to give grace through the things that we say. What does it mean to give grace through our speech? It means that when we speak with others, we should prioritize the spiritual welfare of that other person when we're thinking about what we're going to say and not say. That's what it means to give grace to those who hear. One of the characteristics of corrupt speech is this. Corrupt speech is selfish and it's self-centered. Why are we typically so quick to speak and so slow to listen? Because we are selfish. The flesh wants to put self first, even in our conversations. Uh, rather than listening to what the other person is saying so that we can discern their spiritual needs, what are we doing? We're thinking about what we're going to say, right? Because the conversation has to be about me, 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 I, I, I. Uh, we feel the urge to say something that will impress the other person. We feel the urge to say something that will flaunt our own wisdom and tell about our own achievements or boost our ego in some way. So often our motive in speaking is to build who up? Self. Instead of to build up the other person and to give grace to that other person. So we can't be selfish in our speech. To be selfish is to be corrupt in your talk. We have to change the way we think in conversations from uh, what can I say that will impress this person or cause them to like me to what can I say that will give grace to this person? What do they need to hear? According to the need, give grace, Paul says in verse 29. Uh, we're called to speak in a way that is increasingly unselfish. And we need the Holy Spirit to give us self-control so that we can discipline ourselves in our conversation to put the spiritual welfare of the other person first so that we can give grace instead of subtly engaging in some form of self-promotion or self-aggrandizement. Isaiah 50 and verse 4 says this. This is actually uh, the Spirit of Jesus speaking through the prophet, of, uh, prophet Isaiah uh, about 670 years before Jesus uh, became the Word made flesh. Isaiah 54, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. That's gracious speech, speech that gives grace to those who hear his speech, uh, words that sustain the weary. There are weary people all around us every day, church, and there are anxious people and discouraged people and angry people, and there are insecure people. As Christians, God is calling us to discern the needs and the kind of person that we're speaking with so that we can minister grace to that person in how we respond. 
Paul says, give grace according to the need. What kind of person is this that you're talking to? Is this person angry? They need a certain kind of word. Is this person discouraged? They need a certain kind of word. Is this person uh, insecure? They need a certain kind of word. Give grace according to the need. Of course, there are also arrogant people, and there are selfish people, and there are sinning people, and there are proud people, and they need a different kind of word. They need us to speak to them also in a way that ministers grace. Perhaps sometimes that's a word of confrontation. These different types of people need to be spoken to in different ways because each of them has an individual need. Each type of person needs a, a, a word from us that fits them. And how is this even remotely possible unless we're walking with the Lord every day and abiding in Christ and seeking to have his mind? Otherwise, we're just saying whatever comes to mind. Uh, our goal is not to give grace to those who hear. Our goal is to just make it through the day and uh, people, people need to like us and uh, I need to say something that will impress so-and-so. We need the Holy Spirit's help in this. It is extremely difficult. You know, Jesus knew how to speak in a way that gave grace to his hearers in a way that was calculated to move them toward the Lord. So when you speak to others in a way that gives grace, when that other person is done talking to you, they are closer to Christ than they were before you started talking to them. Jesus was able to discern the specific needs of discouraged people and speak a gracious word of encouragement to them. He was also able to discern the specific needs of proud, self-righteous people and speak a gracious word of confrontation to them. Listen to how he did this in Luke 4. Luke 4, 16 to 30. This is a pretty lengthy passage. I just want you to notice that Jesus speaks to two different kinds of people in this passage, and he has gracious words for both of them, okay? Luke 4, 16 says, Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at what? The gracious words. The gracious words that were coming from his mouth. Jesus had gracious words for the poor, the spiritually blind, captives, the needy. He had some gracious words for them. He said, I'm the Messiah and I'm here today to help you. He also had gracious words for arrogant, hard-hearted Self-righteous people. Listen to the next verse. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months. And a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. So the same Jesus that had gracious words for the poor and the blind and the needy and the oppressed, he also had some gracious words for the self-righteous and the arrogant and the proud. Uh, and when he was done speaking these gracious words to the self-righteous and arrogant and proud who thought we're all right with God because we're Israelites... Uh, the text says they took him to the edge of the hill that the town was built on and they tried to throw him off the cliff. So, Jesus knew which word fit the spiritual needs of each type of hearer and he sought to give grace to them. It was not unkind for Jesus to say those things to those people who were rejecting him because of their own uh, physical heritage. They thought they were right with God because they were the physical descendants of Abraham. Jesus said, I've got a word of grace for you that's supposed to move you toward God. It ain't about your ethnicity. It's about me, and I'm the Messiah. And if you reject me, God will reject you. That's, that's a graceful word too, isn't it? Gracious words are not always easy or nice. Sometimes it's hard to say the gracious thing. 
And too often we avoid saying hard things in an effort to be nice. That is the 11th commandment of the modern church. Thou shalt be nice. And then it has a little asterisk beside that. And at the bottom of the page it says, and mushy too. We don't want to hurt people's feelings and strain our relationship with them. But unfortunately, nice words are not always the kindest thing to say. Why? Because they don't move people toward Jesus. The kind thing to say is the gracious thing that moves people toward Jesus. The overall goal of gracious speech is that it helps the hearer to increasingly become who Jesus wants that man, woman, boy, or girl to be. A lady named Kathy Howard says this. She says, quote, Gracious speech is morally sound and helpful to the hearer. Any words that point the hearer away from Christ or hinder their spiritual growth are destructive. So sometimes we can refuse to speak and hinder people's spiritual growth, can we not? In contrast, gracious speech will always point the hearer to God, always urges them to trust God, always encourages them to follow Jesus. That's what gracious speech does. Gracious words promote spiritual growth, but they're not always nice. Sometimes gracious words will make a person try to throw you off a cliff, but they're still gracious words. Our goal in speaking should be to give grace rather than just empty chatter. When people speak with you, can they leave the conversation thinking it was good and helpful to have talked to you? Is that person closer to the Lord than when they began to talk with you? Did you minister uh, grace to that person in your speech? If you did, they'll be closer to Jesus than when you first started talking to them. So here's some trade-offs that will result in giving grace to your hearers, okay? Let's trade pontificating about our own personal opinions for a nugget of truth from the Word of God. People aren't helped that much by our own personal opinions. They, we give them grace when we give them some portion of truth from the Word of God. Uh, let's trade off continuing to talk about a problem for praying with that person about the problem. That's giving grace, isn't it? Sometimes you've talked about the problem enough and there's really nothing else that can be said. Let's pray about this and ask God to help us with this situation. How about this? Less talk about current events and more talk about things that have eternal significance. And yes, in certain situations, a word of confrontation and challenge to proud and unrepentant people instead of holding your tongue for the 500th time around that proud, arrogant person to their own spiritual detriment just because we want that person to like us when it's all said and done. Those are ways that we can move our speech from uh, giving less grace to giving more grace to our hearers. Look at verse 30. We'll close with verse 30. Paul says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So Paul forbids corrupt speech for two reasons. One is this. It hinders the spiritual growth of our brothers and sisters in Christ and those around us. The second reason is that it grieves God, the Holy Spirit. Corrupt speech grieves the Holy Spirit. Uh, do, do you realize that we cause the Holy Spirit great sorrow and grief through sins, all of our sins, but especially sins of the tongue? Uh, the Holy Spirit is a divine person. He's not a force. You can't grieve a force. Only people grieve. And we can grieve the Spirit with corrupt talk. The Holy Spirit is the one who unites us as Christian people in the body of Christ. Listen to Ephesians 4.3. Ephesians 4.3. Eager to maintain the unity of the what? The Spirit in the bond of peace. So the Holy Spirit unites Christian people in a bond of peace. Think about Ephesians 2.22. shows us that the Holy Spirit is the one who gives spiritual growth to the body of Christ. In Christ you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by who? By the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's uh, particular ministry is to give growth to the body of Christ and unity to the body of Christ. And when we speak to other believers in a way that fractures the unity and hinders the growth, the Holy Spirit is especially grieved by those words that hurt the church in that fashion. So we have to be careful how we speak all the time, but we have to be especially careful the things that we say 
to our brothers and sisters in Christ. If our words do not protect and cultivate the unity of the church, if our words tear down the church, the Holy Spirit is grieved. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this. He says, quote, The test of whether or not our morality is distinctly Christian is this. Is our whole outlook on ethics and morality centered around a desire not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God? This is the way to sanctification, to realize that God the Holy Spirit is in me. And He has been gracious and kind to me. And He is in my brothers and sisters in Christ. And if I sin with my tongue, I am grieving this blessed indwelling person. Anything we do or think that is unholy grieves the Spirit. Look again at verse 30, the end of verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What is the day of redemption? It's the day of Christ's return. It's the day when all who trust in Christ as Lord and Savior will receive the full benefit of all that Jesus did to take away our sin at the cross. The full benefit of all that Jesus did in rising from the tomb to be our righteousness. The full benefit of all that Jesus did to make us adopted sons of our Father in heaven. This day of redemption is the day when Jesus comes back. He makes all things new, a new heaven, a new earth, a new resurrection body for you and I, church. Our fellow believers are sealed and marked, and indwelt, and preserved for this day of redemption by God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit. When we sin against fellow believers with our words, we're sinning against family. Eternal, everlasting family. They have the same eternal destiny. They share in this day of redemption. These are the people we should be quickest to help with our words, fellow believers especially if you're married to a believer or you have children who are believers. These are the people who are so precious to the Lord Jesus, and that's why the Holy Spirit is so grieved and so hurt when our words tear down instead of build up, when they uh, don't give grace instead of giving grace. Jesus had something very sobering to say about our words in Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37. He said this. He said, I tell you, on the day of judgment, People will give account for what? For every careless word they speak. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. In other words, on the last day, our words will show whether we were transformed by the grace of God. They will give evidence. <laughs> There's Brent. He was saved right here. He has a corrupt mouth. Fast forward 30 years. Well, it still ain't all that good, but it has made some progress. <laughs> and it couldn't have made that progress apart from divine grace. Our words will give evidence on the last day of whether we know the Lord. May he give us grace to take off corrupting talk and put on good talk, edifying talk that gives grace. Uh, our prayer needs to be that of the psalmist. Psalm 141.3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Let's pray. Father, please do set a guard over our mouth and keep watch over the door of our lips. Continue to sanctify our mouths. Thank you that in Christ we have been given a new mouth, his mouth. Help us to put it on. Teach us, Lord, where uh, we are harsh or cutting with our words to be more gentle and encouraging. And teach us, Lord, where uh, we refuse to speak up when evil is being perpetrated, or where arrogant people uh, need to be confronted with respect. Teach us to do that as well. Teach us to honor you in the things that we say. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for the uh, literally millions of times that our speech has been rotten. And Lord, we pray uh, that we would not be mouthy, but that we would be measured. And uh, that as we're speaking with people, uh, you, Holy Spirit, would w wither that root of selfishness that's so deep in the old man and help us to be thinking, Father, how can I build this person up? What is their need? What do I need to say? Help us to make our conversations about the spiritual welfare of the people with whom we converse. Uh, Lord, no man can tame the tongue. Teach us how to abide in Christ so the Holy Spirit 
himself can tame our tongue. And Holy Spirit, we ask your forgiveness uh, for the ways that we've grieved you in the way that we've spoken to fellow believers. Lord, cause these words to penetrate our heart and bear good fruit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ivy's going to play a couple verses. You go to the Lord in prayer and prepare your heart to take communion. Let me remind you that this sacred time at the Lord's table is for believers in Jesus Christ who have rested all their hope on the merits of the Lord Jesus, His death for our sin, His resurrection for our justification, and have been baptized. If you're not yet a baptized believer, you should refrain from partaking until you have come to faith in Christ. Uh, the Lord's table is for saved sinners. All Christians are saved sinners. But if you're living in open, hard-hearted defiance of any of Christ's clear commands, we ask that you would refrain from partaking until you can make that right with the Lord Jesus. And if your hope is in the Lord and you're seeking to walk with Him by faith and you have been baptized, we want to uh, remind you that these elements proclaim to you the enormity of the Father's love for you, brothers and sisters. He did not spare His own Son, but He gave Him up for us all. So as you partake of the cup and of the bread... Uh, the Father in heaven is saying something to you. He's saying, I love you with an infinite love. When you're ready, you may come.
Lord Jesus said this to his disciples in Matthew chapter 26, just before he went to the cross. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and sing nothing but the blood. Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us 
and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. You're at liberty to go.